in 2 Timothy chapter 3 today talking about the Word of God, its power, its sufficiency, its veracity. So open with us as we look at what the Scriptures do in our lives. Follow along 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, let's pick it up at verse 14. Paul there writes, But you must continue in the things which you have heard, or which you have learned, and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood... You have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. Father, as we open to this passage, I pray that just as it says of your scripture that the word is useful, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that we would be equipped thoroughly. I pray that our time in the scriptures today would bring about that further transformation, that further equipping, that we would be ready to do those things that bring you honor and praise and glory, but they they not only bring you honor and praise and glory, but they also bring us in in increasing joy. So God, work in us by the power of your spirit, by the power of your word. We pray this, we ask this in Jesus' name. And all those that agreed said, Amen. amen. You may be seated. This has been a, it's long been a favorite passage of mine for a number of reasons, and being that it's a favorite passage of mine, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 especially, I, I often return to it in my teaching, and, and not just in my teaching, but many, many times as I'm praying, as we're preparing to go into the scriptures, I, I come back to the truth of this passage of scripture here. In fact, it's my pattern. You, you may have observed it, that when we gather together as we do on a Sunday morning, we read from the scriptures and then I pray and I, I pray, God, it's our belief, it's our conviction that this is your inspired word. God breathed is literally the way to interpret the word inspired there or translate it and that your inspired word, it's useful in our lives, that it has an impact, it has an effect, which ultimately ends up being a really good thing and that God would you by the transforming of our minds, renew us, make us new, that we would bring glory to you. So I pray this many, many times as I go through the scriptures, preaching them. And that word here in verse 17, talking about being thoroughly equipped, it has a strong connection to my call into the work or the ministry of preaching, pastoral preaching and teaching. That you know, it was now, I just celebrated 20 years, last month, 20 years teaching through the scriptures, and it was when I was 19 years old that I, I received that call very clearly and, and started to follow that call to preach and teach the scriptures, and it had a lot to do with this concept of equipping people in the church, in the body of Christ. The, there were two passages of scripture that the Lord impressed upon my heart when I started to move in that direction, one found in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, you can just jot it down, you don't have to turn there, in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 12, there in verse 23, Samuel, who was a judge, kind of the the executive, if you will, over the nation of Israel at that time, he said this to the people in 1 Samuel 12, 23, moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord and cease to pray for you and I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all of your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. And that passage, it was strongly impressed upon my heart when Pastor Tony, sitting back there, when he asked me if I would teach the junior high ministry at this church, and my first inclination was no. You ever had one of those things where someone, will you do this? And you just think, no. But you have to do the spiritual thing was say, I'll pray about it. (laughs) That's like... Christian for no. (laughs) Let me pray about that. So I actually did pray about it, and I happened to be in 1 Samuel 12 when I was praying about it, and I read that, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord and cease to teach you the good and the right way. I thought, well, now, there we go. Thanks for that. 
There is another passage, too, um, in the New Testament, in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, where Paul says, And he, God, gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for a specific work, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. So I knew very early on, early on from those two passages, 1 Samuel 12 and Ephesians 4, that God was calling me to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Now, one of the things you can identify in church history as you look at the movement of the Christian church from the earliest days, 2,000 years ago until now, is that probably the biggest low points for the church in church history is when the church has started to believe and expect that the work of the church, the work of the ministry, we might call it, is done by the, quote, professional clergy, those who are educated, trained, called to the professional clergy. That's not the way that the church works, not biblically. The way that the church biblically works, according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, is that the, the professional, if you will, ministry, those who are doing the work of the ministry, are equipping the saints. That's the church for the work of the ministry. So we strongly believe, and each time that you see the church begin to have greater impact, it's when the church begins to understand this very strong biblical truth of what we refer to as the priesthood of all believers, that if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a believer in the things of Scripture, then you are called to the work of the ministry. And my task, my calling, is to equip you for that work. Now, the the simple question then is, if that task is to equip people for the work of the ministry, how exactly does one do that? And in one sense, the passage before us here in 2 Timothy chapter 3 it begins to answer that question. Pastor Paul writes to Pastor Timothy, and he says, but you must continue in the things, verse 14, which you have learned and have been assured of knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. You must continue in the things that you have learned. This is a command. It's in the imperative. When we read the word continue there in the original language, it is a command. That's why in some translations it says, you must continue in these things that you have learned. And that word learned is connected to the Greek word for disciple. So Paul says, Timothy, you have been with me. By this point, Timothy had probably been with the apostle Paul for about 15 years. And during all of that period of time, he was learning as a disciple. So he says, You need to continue in the things you've been discipled in. Knowing from whom you have learned them. Knowing who has discipled you. Paul says, I have taught you this very thing. You've seen it. You've imitated me. Now continue in it. Now, Paul, these are Paul's last words. That's why it says on your sermon guide there, last words. Last words as he's giving exhortations to Timothy. He knows he's probably not going to see him again. It is possible there are some historians who believe that Paul, within a matter of weeks after writing this letter, was beheaded for his faith in around the year 66 AD. So he says, listen, you've got to continue in the things that you have learned from me as a disciple from me. And you have learned these things from your childhood, having known the Holy Scriptures, which brings up kind of a sideline point, but an important point. How did Timothy, who probably met Paul when he was in his teenage years, How did Timothy come to the knowledge of the scriptures? Well, the answer is found in the first chapter of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1. There, Paul refers to his training as a child from his mother and his grandmother, Eunice and Lois. They have a place in scripture because his grandma and grandpa, or grandma, I'm sorry, grandma and mom, who were Jewish individuals, they raised him knowing the scriptures. And the, the real important truth to kind of glean from that is to recognize how impactful it is to be one who gives forth the word of God to your kids and your grandkids. Never underestimate the importance of sharing the Holy Scriptures with your children and your grandchildren. As time goes by, the older we get, the more we start to think about things like a legacy. What are we leaving behind? And the fact is, every single one of us is going to die someday. I hate to break it to you if you didn't know that, but we're all going to die someday. And The cold, hard truth is that within about a generation or two, people will not remember you. 
That's hard for us to wrestle with. There's very few people that are remembered for a very long period of time. 99.9% of people, they will not be remembered a couple generations after they have gone on. But you can leave a legacy, and the greatest legacy I think that you can leave with your kids and grandkids is a knowledge of the Word of God. Never underestimate how important that legacy is. Why is that legacy so important? Well, because notice what Paul says about the Holy Scriptures there. He says, the Holy Scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. How else will anybody know about the salvation that is in Christ Jesus apart from the Scriptures? They won't. We can learn a lot through observation, through science, all the different sciences. There's much that we can learn about the cosmos that we are in, the creation that we have been given. But how will we know about the broken condition of man, where it comes from? We can identify the brokenness that is in the world, but how will we know where it comes from? How will we know how to address and deal with that problem apart from the revelation of the Holy Scriptures? Only the Scriptures have the words of eternal life. Only the Scriptures have the words of eternal life. That's why they are so important. Paul, in his letter to the church at Rome, he builds on this idea, on this truth, when he writes this in Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a proclaimer, a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Then here's the important verse, Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So in this, we are convinced that the words of eternal life are contained. Therefore, it is essential that we be those who leave the legacy of giving the word of God to our kids and our grandkids. Salvation by faith in Christ Jesus is not found anywhere except from the Holy Scriptures. And on this point of the importance of the Holy Scriptures, Paul writes that they are given by inspiration of God. Verse 16, the focus of our, our time here this morning, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. This is a very important verse and it will be found at the beginning of nearly every systematic theology book that is available. If you go and buy any systematic theology book, and there are volumes and volumes and volumes of systematic theology books, virtually every theology book begins with a chapter on the Word of God, on the Holy Scriptures, because where do we get theology? Where do we study God other than in the Scriptures? So every theology book begins with a chapter dealing with the importance of the Word of God and why we believe that it is authoritative and why we believe that it has a place in our lives and is inerrant. It all starts there, chapter one of every theology book, and on the first pages of virtually every one of those chapters on theology and the Word of God, this verse is found. It is very important to an understanding of the Scriptures. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable. Point number one on your outline, simple point, all scripture is inspired and useful. That is our conviction here at Cross Connection Church. All scripture is inspired and useful. Now, I'm sure it won't surprise you that that point is contested by many. All scripture is inspired and useful. It's contested by those who are outside the church that do not believe themselves to be believers in the scriptures, that question the things of the scriptures, which I completely understand those questions. I think there's great answers to those questions. Oftentimes, those, their own questions need to be questioned. But, but there are people who have questions about these things and would say, I don't believe that all scripture is inspired and useful. That's perfectly fine. We have answers for those difficult questions. So there are those outside the church who have a problem with this point, but there are those within the church that have a problem with this point because there are different ways in which people within the church will look at the truth of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, or the way in which they will read 2 Timothy 3, 16. There is a group within the Christian circle, understand the church, big C church is a big tent, and there's a lot of people from different areas in that tent 
And there are some that will look at this passage and they will read it, all scripture inspired by God is profitable. Now, that may not seem like a big change to what I read in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, but it has major implications. Because when someone says, all scripture that is inspired is useful, what they're saying is, I'm not sure that all scripture is inspired. And then they become the arbiters, they become the judges of what is inspired and what is not inspired. And there have been those who have actually gone through the scriptures and essentially they will underline the passages that they believe are inspired and they will cross out the passages that they don't believe are inspired. One very notable person in our own history that did that was Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson went through the Bible and he cut out with an actual blade, cut out large sections of the gospels that he said he didn't believe was inspired. And so therefore, all scripture that is inspired is useful and profitable, but I get to be the judge of what is inspired and what is not inspired. Now, you may be able to see a problem with that. So what ends up happening is people will begin to read the scriptures and say, listen, those, those things that say things like, you should love your neighbor, that's inspired, you should do that, that's useful. They'll say those passages that say, you should take care of the poor, that's inspired, you should do that. But then they'll say anything that has to do with sexuality or immorality or sin, they'll say, oh, well, you, do, you can disregard that. You may not think this is a problem, it's a huge problem. This has been happening for a very long time within the church. It's happening quite frequently today, pardon me. So it was a problem in the church that Timothy was overseeing in Asia Minor 2,000 years ago, and it's certainly a problem in the United States of America in the 21st century. The correct way to interpret this passage, according to the actual reading of the text, is just as it reads here in the scriptures we have before us. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. That word and is in the manuscripts. And so when we see it read in that way, then we have to wrestle with it, and sometimes it is a wrestling match to wrestle with the fact that all the scriptures contained here are inspired, that is, they're God-breathed, we believe it comes from him, and they are useful, profitable. Now, that's a challenge for us because we read passages, how many of you know that as you read the Bible, it is a book that also reads you? And so as you read through the scriptures, the Apostle James, he, he speaks of the scriptures being like a mirror, that when we look into the perfect law of liberty, it like a mirror, it shines back on us and we see ourselves, which means that all those passages in the Bible that you don't like, what you actually don't like is what is showing you about you. That's what you don't like. That's why my nature, our flesh, doesn't really like to read the Bible. That's why you have a wrestling match with reading the Bible. Anybody struggled sometimes? You don't have to raise your hand. I do. You go, you're a pastor, you can't struggle with reading the Bible. Yeah, my flesh doesn't like it just like anybody else. So there are things, you read it, it reads you. One author in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 4, says the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts deep and divides between joint and marrow, soul and spirit, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. It, it, it exposes the deep thought and intent of our heart, and sometimes, as it does, that is painful. But we do not get to be the arbiters, the judges of what is or is not inspired because the scriptures attest to the fact that they are inspired and the writers of the New Testament were conscious, conscious of the guidance of the Holy Spirit in their writing, just as Peter makes clear in his letter, 2 Peter chapter 1, he says in verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture, no Inspiration of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So it is the belief of the church for the last 2,000 years that God, he inspires people to pen, write these things. He breathes these things, and therefore, they are useful. What are they useful for? Well, Paul gives four things in this verse that the scriptures are useful for. First, he says... The scriptures are profitable or useful for doctrine. Well, what exactly is doctrine? Paul uses that word no less than 11 times in 1 and 2 Timothy, doctrine. He exhorts Timothy and Titus in what are called the pastoral epistles, which we've studied over the last couple of years. He exhorts them to maintain a strong adherence to sound doctrine, didaskaleia in the Greek. And so here he says that 
The, the scriptures are useful for doctrine. They are inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, and they are useful for our training and our instruction. One way to look at this as useful for doctrine is that doctrine establishes what is right and true. So if the, the scriptures are useful for doctrine, then they are, esta- they are useful for establishing for us what is right and true. Now here's What happens when you establish what is right or true? When you establish the line of what is right or true, it immediately does the next thing that the scriptures are useful for. The scriptures are useful for doctrine. Next, reproof. What is reproof? Reproof is that which exposes what is out of alignment. In fact, one Greek lexicon on this, it says, to expose and to shame by exposure. So it rebukes is another way. When you establish the right line and say, that's true, that's righteous, then immediately we see all the ways in which you and I do not align with what is true and righteous. This is why the psalmist in Psalm 119 would say, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It enlightens us as to our true condition. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 3 and again in Romans chapter 7 when he says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in God's sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Paul in Romans chapter 7 says, How would I have known sin unless the Bible said, Thou shalt not covet? You see, every one of us from the our weeest little point, we are really, really good at being jealous, jealous and covetous. Did you notice? If you have not seen this and you haven't had children, just wait. We are by nature jealous, covetous beings. Now, we would think, hey, well, that's just normal. That's just the way we are. But the Bible comes in and says, thou shalt not covet. So it exposes and shows us the areas where we are wrong. The, the best illustration, I believe, of what the Bible does in setting the right line and exposing our error is this tool right here. Some of you know what this is. This is one of the oldest tools used by humanity going all the way back to the Bronze Age, 4,600 years ago in Egypt. It's, it's a simple tool. It's called a plumb bob. And what does a plumb bob do? Well, because of gravity, it shows us the the perfect straight line. And as soon as you have the perfect straight line, you immediately see all the things that are crooked. Now, that's what the scriptures do. They establish the perfect straight line. And the perfect straight line is the nature of God. The Bible, the scriptures, the holy scriptures are the revelation of the nature of God. So it shows us God's nature. It shows us his perfect righteousness. It shows us what he requires of us. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, to walk in humility with God. So the Bible shows us what is right, and then it shows us all the ways that we are out of alignment. Now, here's the problem with humanity and human-created religion. Human-created religion causes us to not look at the nature of God and the revelation of God, but to look at the actions of others. And when we use that as our guideline, you can find anybody more crooked than you. So that's what we tend to do. We go, yeah, I realize I'm not that good, but I'm so much better than that guy. Isn't that what we do? It is. And the deeds, or I should say the misdeeds of others, justify us. Make us feel like, well, I'm so much better than I am. And listen, if you're having a hard time finding someone worse off than you, it's not too hard. I mean, you can always say something like, well, I'm better than Dahmer. That's easy. But if that's your standard, you're in trouble, right? (laughs) So we generally just look for standards of righteousness that are worse off than us, and we just say, well, I'm better than that. But when you set up the perfect law of liberty, you go, well, I'm way out of alignment. So the word of God is useful for setting the right line and reproving the wrong. It shows us where we are out of alignment. It exposes our error after establishing what is right. But here's the thing. This, This tool... It has a very simple purpose. It shows the right line, but it can't fix it. It has no power in and of itself to fix the problem. But Paul says the word of God is more powerful than this because the word of God, it is useful for doctrine, establishing the right line, for reproof, exposing our error. But he says the third thing, it is useful for correction. That literally means to set right, to amend, to restore, to improve, to correct. And this is why Paul, or I'm sorry, Jesus on the night that he would be betrayed, 
He's in praying to the Father in John 17, verse 17, and he says, Father, sanctify, that is cleanse and make right and purify, sanctify them with your truth. Your word is truth. So the word of God has the ability within it to transform us. In Romans 12, Paul says, transform us by the renewing of our minds. So God begins first with his word to renew our minds, and then he transforms our, our thoughts and deeds and actions. And then in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says that, Jesus desires to wash us by the washing of the water by his word. So the word of God is useful for doctrine. It establishes the true line for correction. It exposes where we are wrong, but then it also has the ability to correct. Now, at this point, there may be some of you that are skeptical of this. You say, come on, you really believe these things? Well, wisdom, it is said by Jesus, is justified by her children. So here's the test. Is it true or not that we see people who live according to the principles of Scripture and their lives are made better? I would suggest to you that we have 2,000 years of history, empirical evidence of people being transformed by the power of the Word of God. Why is that? Because it is the inspired Word of God, and it is useful for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and fourth, he says, it is useful for instruction in righteousness, training, discipline, discipleship. The scriptures, once once establishing righteousness and exposing error, they restore us to rightness and they are able to help us maintain a righteous heading. A good illustration of this is the navigation system you might have on your smartphone or in your car. I'm sure that many of you have used one of those. And and what does it do? You you put into the navigation system where you want to go. It shows where you're at, where you want to go, and it shows a line between those two things, and it shows you where you're out of order. Now, if I were making one of those things, I would have it talk to you and say something like, you're on the wrong path, bozo. (laughs) So, So we are able to see that's where we want to go, that's where we are, here's the true line, doctrine, here's where we are, reproof, correction, here's how to get back on the line and maintain the line. That's what the scriptures do in our lives. And the proof is in the outcomes. Is that what happens? Yes, as people give themselves to the scriptures, we see that this is the truth. How can a young man cleanse his way? The psalmist says in Psalm 119, verse 9, by taking heed according to your word. Psalm 1, the opening psalm of the 150 psalms of scripture says, blessed is the one who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, And in his law, he does meditate day and night. And that person shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water who brings forth his fruit in his season. Whatever he does shall prosper. Joshua, great leader of Israel who brought the children of Israel into the promised land after the death of Moses, as he's preparing to come into the promised land, God has a word for Joshua and for the people. It's recorded in Joshua chapter 1, verse 6. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give to them. Only be thou strong and courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. And here's the point. This book of the law, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will have success and be prosperous. The Holy Scriptures are useful, Paul says. They're useful for doctrine, showing us the right line, reproof, showing us where we are out of order, correction, bringing us back in alignment, and instruction in righteousness, so that, that's what we read, verse 17, 2 Timothy chapter 3, so that, in fact, in, in my translation here, it just says that, but you can write so in front of it, so that the man of God or woman of God, it's a universal word for man in Greek there, so that the man or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. God breathed the scriptures for the purpose of, so that, The man or woman of God would be complete, thoroughly equipped. That's God's aim in inspiring the scriptures. And that's our hope in preaching the scriptures, that God will accomplish what he said he would do with the word, and his word will not return void. It will accomplish what he set it forth to do, the prophet Isaiah said 2,800 years ago. God's word will not return void. 
And when you come to discover God's end, his purpose, in inspiring the scriptures, you begin to realize, point number two, all people need what the scriptures have to offer. This is why I've been so committed to the Bible for so long. I believe that all people need what the scriptures have to offer. What? To be complete? I mean, isn't that what people are seeking for? A completeness, a wholeness? We are surrounded by people all the time that are realizing they're at the deepest level some sort of brokenness. Something is missing. We live in a nation that arguably has more than any other people at any other time have ever had. And yet we feel like we are missing something. This crazy article came out in the New York Times about a week and a half ago. Charles Duhigg, author of a great book called The Power of Habit, came out a couple years ago. He went and attended a reunion with all of his Harvard MBA friends, 20-year reunion. And there he's meeting all these guys. Some of them are making millions of dollars a year, trading stocks on Wall Street at $500 million a week and making big money. And his entire article was, I met all my friends who are doing this and say, I have no meaning and I hate my life. You go, what on earth is going on? Money will not make you complete. Relationships will leave you incomplete. Everything that this world has to offer will not satisfy humanity's deepest need. This is what Blaise Pascal in the 16th century, French theologian and philosopher, he says, there is a void in the heart of every human being. It is only filled by what the scriptures have to offer, by Christ Jesus. We're disconnected from God, and without a connection to God, we will not experience satisfaction or completeness And so all people need what the scriptures have to offer because, point number three, only by the working of the scriptures are we equipped and complete. There is an incompleteness in humanity. All of us can identify it. And even those who are the most ardent atheists or agnostics are deeply seeking for meaning. One of the most outspoken atheists of our day, a man by the name of Sam Harris, I've talked about him frequently, he is on a mission in his life to find a sustainable meaning. He believes it will be found in psychedelics and meditation. I suggest to you, that won't do it. Some of you tried that like 50 years ago. (laughs) You, You got probably more experience in that than he does. But he's searching for something. Why? Because he realizes this truth. There is a gaping hole in our, what we call our soul. And so only by the working of the scriptures are we equipped and complete. This, this completeness, it, it speaks of sufficiency. It speaks of being proficient and capable. And one of the literal definitions of this is exactly fitted. And the picture that came to my mind, how many of you have ever had the curse of buying some furniture piece at Ikea? Lift your hands up. Come on. <laughs> confess. Come on. Let's confess it. It's confession time. here. You get this box home. You go, how is that going to turn into a couch? Right? You get this box. And this is going to be a giant entertainment center. You, you break it out, and there's these instructions that were created by someone who's sadistic and just wants to just make you live in the flesh. And, and then there's all these pieces put together. And maybe you've had this experience. I have. You take out this nut and this bolt and you try to put these things together and you realize this nut is not threaded to this bolt. But you know, your wife is saying, come on, build it. You can do it. <laughs> so what do you do? It's not fitted, but you, you make it work. You make that sucker work, whatever, it's going to work. You'll never be able to move that. And if you do, it falls apart. That's where Ikea makes their money. They just, they know they're going to sell it to you again in six months. Well, that's tangential. Tangential. Anyways, so it's not fully fitted, but we'll make it work. And there are a lot of people, they're trying to make something work. It's not exactly fitted, but eh, maybe it'll piece this together in my life. But it's not working. And so the scriptures make us complete. They make us thoroughly equipped, fully qualified, finished, adequate to whatever we will face in this life. You know, The biggest challenge that skeptics bring against Christianity today is not the hypocritical church, though there's plenty of hypocrites in the church, but there's plenty of hypocrites everywhere. 
The biggest challenge that skeptics bring against the Christian church is the question of suffering and God. But if you turn it around and you start to talk to the skeptic, you'll find that they don't have any answer how to deal with suffering any better. But in reality, what you find is that the Christian is far better suited, more equipped to deal with the difficulties and the trials of life than the non-believer. I got a call this morning at 5.53 in the morning from the battalion chief from the Escondido Fire Department. And he said, uh, we had a major fire and there's a gal here and she wasn't at the home when it happened, but the house burned down and she's really distraught and she's asking questions about why did God allow this? And he goes, I don't know how to answer that question. Can you come by? So I said, sure, I'll come by. And I show up in uniform and I walk up and the battalion chief says to the gal, hey, this is Pastor Miles, or this is our chaplain, Miles. And she looks at me, she goes, Pastor Miles? And I didn't expect that. Um, but as I started to talk with her, about the truth of the scriptures and the nature of God, even though she's distraught over what's just happened, she is more fully equipped to navigate the difficulty of this life so that we might be fully equipped. So then if it is true that the scriptures are God-breathed and that they are useful for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness for our completeness, for our equipping, if that is true, and I, I can tell you there's plenty of empirical evidence of many people who have found that to be true, then what ought we to do with the Holy Scriptures? Well, look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. In light of this, every time you see the word therefore, and it's there four words in, anytime you see the word therefore, it's saying because of all that truth, because the word of God is inspired and it gives us knowledge of salvation and it makes us whole and complete, I charge you therefore because of that and, and this is a command. I command you, Timothy, because of all that truth. And not only does he give a strong exhortation, a command, a charge, but he gives a, a strong exhortation with a strong warning. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing, preach the word. Point number four. We must hold the scriptures as accountable stewards. Here's what this means. If you're a believer in the scripture today, if you are convinced based upon what you've learned from the scriptures and what you've seen of how they've worked out in your life, if you are convinced that they make you wise to salvation and that they've brought completeness and wholeness in your life, and that they've had the ability to show you the right line and show you where your life is out of line and bring you back into alignment and walk the line, if you believe all of that, what should you do in response to it? Paul says, therefore, preach the word. So we should be those who hold the scriptures as accountable stewards because notice what he says there. I charge you, therefore, in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, that one day we will stand before him and give an account as to how we held the powerful word of God. What did we do with it? Did we just learn it, study it, meditate on it, memorize it? Or did we use it and give it forth? How have we used these things? And this exhortation is not just, I believe it's not just to the pastoral class in the church, it's to the whole of the body of Christ so that we would be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Because God created you and I for good works that we would walk in these things. And so we must hold the scriptures as accountable stewards. And what is he commanded? What are we charged to do with the scriptures? Verse 2, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Preach the word. Exclamation point. Put a star next to it. Put an underline. Circle it. Whatever you have to do to emphasize this. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season at all times. To do what? To convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Now, I don't have enough time to dig deeply into this verse. We'll do that next week. I hope you'll be here. We'll look at verse 1 and 2 of 1st, 2nd Timothy 4 more slowly and, and pick it apart. What does it mean to convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching? Well, it aligns with what we just saw. The Word of God is useful for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. And so, therefore, we convince, rebuke, exhort with all patience, which is hard for some of us. But point number five, faithful stewards of the inspired scriptures preach the word. We will give an account, church, that we will. We will stand before the Lord one day 
and give an account. Jesus says, for every idle word, we'll give an account. That's frightening. But we will give an account. And so as faithful stewards, that's managers of another's resources, of the inspired scriptures, preach the word. If the scriptures are truly holy, Paul calls them the holy scriptures in verse 14, if they do make us wise to salvation, if they are inspired and useful for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, then the only right response of the faithful steward is to proclaim and herald the truth of the scriptures, even if it is perceived to be by a culture that is increasingly antagonistic to the things of God, even if it is perceived to be offensive and narrow and politically incorrect and a stumbling block. And it is. It is increasingly politically incorrect to believe and teach the things of the Bible. But we aim to please God and not man. Because at the appearing of his kingdom, which is spoken of in this passage, you won't be standing before the court of public opinion. It won't really matter what other people have thought about the word of God when you stand before the one who inspired the word of God. And so it's my aim as a pastor to equip with the word of God so that we corporately can be able to speak forth the truth of the word. Why? Well, Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to teach you the good in the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth, for consider what great things he's done for you. This week, you're going to encounter a lot of people who are broken. Some of them will have experienced a loss this weekend. Some of them have recently found out that they have a terminal disease. Some of them are going to find out that maybe they don't have a job anymore. So whatever the issue may be, you will encounter people who are broken this, broken because of we live in a broken world. But we have the words of eternal life. You'll find people who are walking in a way that will ultimately not be good for them or the people that are around them. And the word of God has instruction for that. Now it it requires sometimes a rebuke us showing the true line and and showing where they're out of line. And what typically people will do when you start to show them with the word of God where their life doesn't line up, they'll instantly turn it back on you and say, you're just as bad as I am. And you can say, yeah, I'm totally crooked too. I got a problem. What are we going to do about it? There's an answer in the scriptures. Amen? And so may it be that we be those who have a confidence in the word of God in season and out of season. Some of you might feel a little out of season but God wants to equip you by his word. So would you stand with me as we close in prayer and ask God to continue that work because it's it's a work that God does by his spirit as he works in us to will and to do his good pleasure. So Father, we pray that you would work in us by your grace, by your all-sufficient power where we are insufficient, For just as Paul said, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as being of ourselves, our sufficiency comes from you. You are the one who makes us able ministers, servants of the gospel. You enable us. So God, would you pour out your spirit upon us, your church, and give us a confidence in the scriptures, in the authority, in the sufficiency, in the power of your word. God, give us a confidence to walk in these things and to give this good news out to those that we interact with and to walk these things out. And in the areas of our lives where we realize we are not in alignment, God, would you bring us back into alignment as we confess, as we repent, as your word has its work in our lives. God, do that work in us, we pray. Pour out your spirit upon your church, we pray. For we ask this in Jesus' name and all those that agree to say, let's sing to